Stefan, welcome and thank you for joining. So a robust immune reaction is what we're seeing out of your early phase trials. The next phase underway, how big will it be? How many people will be involved? Yes, uh, thank you for having me. So this is the data from the, the phase one, the first three cohort. This was 45 healthy adults uh, run in Seattle. The next uh, study is a phase two of around 600 healthy subjects that should start very soon. The FDA in the U.S. has just given us the green light. And we said this morning that we are finalizing the protocol for the phase three, which is the last clinical study before approval, which we are hoping to start in July of this year. Uh, the study will be uh, several thousand healthy subjects across many countries. We are finalizing the protocol as we speak with the FDA, and we are hoping that if we can start in July as is our plan, uh, after a few months of enrolling all those people in the studies, we should be able in the fall to get a good sense of the efficacy of a vaccine and of fully filing for commercial approval towards the end of the year. In terms of data, Stefan, how many doses does it look like the drug will need to be used in? And then in terms of antibody titers, these are the levels that regulators are looking for to establish benchmarks of success. What would you want those to be in the US? Yes, so indeed, uh, the, the piece that is exciting about this morning news is at the two lower dose we we tried. So we tried three doses in the phase one, 25 microgram, 100 microgram, and 250 microgram. Um, and it's typical of a phase one where you try different doses to see where you get the best response. Uh, and we're very pleased to report that after two doses or prime and a boost, three weeks apart, that all the participants, and it's still a small study, huh? but all participants at the 25 microgram and one other microgram showed that they were having binding antibodies in their blood coming from vaccination that were at or above the level seen in convalescent sera, so i.e. in the blood of people who had been infected, which is what we are all shooting for in terms of how much antibody do you need. So we're very excited about this data. Stefan, it's Guy in London. So I've got a couple of questions just to follow up there. Um, the first one is, when people get um, COVID-19 naturally, do they have immunity once they have had it? Because you're producing more antibodies than a natural response. So I'm wondering, is it a longevity issue? If you are producing greater amounts of antibodies with, with your therapy, do I get longer immunity than I would if I've actually had COVID-19? That's what we believe. I want to be careful because, as you know, because you, you report on the, the virus daily, we are still learning a lot about this virus. And I think all of us have to be very cautious about statements we make around the understanding of the biology of this virus. But that is indeed what we believe. We believe that if we're able to boost your immune system to a very high level above the concentration in the blood of people that are convalescent from infection, that should be very helpful. And we've shown that before. We have uh, just finished a phase two study for another virus called cytomegalovirus, which is a very nasty virus, especially to women in the age of bearing a child. If a woman gets infected during pregnancy, she can lose her child or have you know, very bad birth defect on, on the child. It's the number one cause of birth defect in Europe or in the US. And there is no vaccine approved on the market. And we have shown in that study that we were able to boost a zero negative, i.e. people that were never exposed to the virus, to around 10 times higher antibody to people that have been exposed to virus. But even people that have been exposed to the virus were able to boost the antibodies to provide them stronger immunity. So that's why we are cautiously right. optimistic. It's so older people tend to have less effective immune systems. So I'm curious, you, you have the initial dose and then you have a booster that comes after it. 
Is it likely that older people might get a, uh, the, a kind of bigger second dose? Uh, you maybe you start off with the 25 and then maybe you have a, a 100 booster afterwards or the other way. I'm not sure exactly which way it's going to work. But, but could you tailor the, the first one, the primary and the secondary one, depending on age, to ensure that, that um, less effective immune systems can generate the kind of responses that you're talking about? So the current design of the study is to use the same dose of prime and the boost, but we are studying different age cohorts. The data we released this morning is for 18 to 55 years of age, so people that are healthy with a kind of quote, normal adult immune system. We have also added three cohorts in the U.S. of 55 to 70 years old and three additional cohorts from 71 and above. So we'll have to see and learn from the clinic, which is why we do those clinical studies. We could indeed potentially increase the second dose. What has been shown for other viruses and other vaccines, which is the boost is very important, especially for people that have a weaker immune system, like the elderly uh, or the very young or people that have an immune disease or so on. Because when you basically do the first injection, you prime the immune system, you educate it and then the antibody mature in your, in your white cells. And then when you hit it again, three, four weeks after, this is when you actually create memory, memory immunity, which is very important. So we'll have to see with clinical data how to best customize and adapt to different age groups. And we will just follow the clinical data to design the best product we can. What have the analyst and investor community suggested regarding the pricing model? Should this actually come to market commercially eventually? You must be thinking about pricing. So as I shared this morning, because indeed I got the question, we have been so busy in the last four months to just focus on, one, getting the vaccine to move as fast as possible from a sequence, because remember, the sequence of this virus was first made public by the Chinese government on January 11. That is just four months ago. And we are with the green light to go into phase two from the FDA and finalizing the design of a phase three to start as early as July. So on the clinical front, our team has been so busy on just making this happen. And on the manufacturing front, we just announced two weeks ago a very strategic partnership with Lanza from Switzerland to boost our manufacturing capacity Pre-COVID, we never had the plan in 2020 and 2021 to make so many doses that is required to protect millions, hundreds of millions of people. And so the plants we have in Massachusetts in the U.S. is able to roughly do, assuming a 50 microgram dose or mid dose, to do around 100 million dose per year, which is for most commercial vaccines is very large. But when you have 7 billion people on the planet who are mostly naive to this virus, it's very tiny. And so we set a challenge with the team a few months ago. How do we set up ourselves to be able to provide up to 1 billion doses per year? And so this partnership with Lanza is very enabling because they have the expertise, they have you know, clean rooms available where we can basically buy new equipment, put it in their facilities and scale up the manufacturing process from being able to do now you know, millions of doses per month to soon dozens of millions of doses per month to soon high dozen, you know, uh, up to you know, close to 80 million doses a month to an equivalent of a billion doses per year. Yes. So we've already been focusing on that in the last four months and literally working uh, seven days a week. What we're going to do now is to really start to think about the, the vaccine in terms of first its value. What's the value of this vaccine to the healthcare system? As you know, the cost of the healthcare system be between ICU stay, mask, uh, all the disruption happening is, is very high. So we want to do commit that analysis uh, because we're not going to launch in the next month or so. Yes. And then we're going to have, of course, discussion with, with governments because we want, of course, to be responsible given we are facing a pandemic. Stefan, I want to ask you about the ties and back and forth with the administration and how critical that is. So you have received $500 million from the administration in federal funds 
to work on this. Also, one of your board members has just become the chief scientist for Operation Warp Speed. How critical is administration support? And will the US be first in line if there is indeed a vaccine at the end of this that works? So that's a, that's a good question. So the role of government and large foundation is critical. What I worry the most about now is not how we're going to get the Moderna vaccine to work. I believe with what we've seen today, there's a good probability that the vaccine showing the antibody response we shared today, showing we can protect animals uh, fully uh, and uh, protecting against replication of the virus in the lungs of the animals. I believe that those two data sets, plus all the data we have on all nine other vaccines that have been into the clinic, makes me believe these vaccines should provide protection. But what I worry the most about is so far we have not been able to get any help on manufacturing capacity. If we wait for the product to be approved, let's assume a best case scenario toward the end of this year, which would be remarkable. Uh, usually, you know, it takes five, eight, ten years to get vaccine approved. If we don't have enough capacity, people are going to die. Economies are going to stay impacted. Uh, and we need government to be aggressive. In the U.S., we got help, as you say, from the U.S. government. It is to help us fund very large clinical studies, which, of course, is very helpful. But as of today, we have not received from any government or any large foundation any help to, toward buying equipment, Yep. buying raw materials so that we can make as many doses as we can now to have as many doses as we can ready to ship the day hopefully we'll get an approval. Stefan, I've just got a couple of quick, I, I, I sort of actually just folded into one. Um, does the first country to approve it, does the first region to approve it get the vaccine first, following up on Vonnie's question, and messenger RNA vaccines in the past have, uh, we, I, I, have we ever seen a messenger RNA vaccine approved thus far? Do you think it's going to be harder for a messenger RNA vaccine to be approved? So, A, does the first country, first region to approve it get it first? Is there going to be any order in terms of sequencing of who gets it first? Is there any pressure from any country to deliver it first, i.e. from Washington? And is it harder for a messenger RNA vaccine to get approved in the first place, do you think? So those are great questions. So on the first question, we are only allowed to provide the products where approved. As you know, medicine is a highly regulated uh, industry. If, let's say, in the UK the vaccine is not approved, we're not allowed by law to sell the vaccine. And so let's say if it's approved in the US and not in the UK, I'm just not allowed to sell it in the UK. But vice versa, obviously, if it's approved in the UK but not approved in the US, I'm allowed to sell it in the you can't not allowed to sell it in the U.S. So the regulatory framework is something that we all in the industry depend upon, and I, I have to have approval to be allowed to provide the product. On the mRNA question, uh, indeed, there has to this date uh, no mRNA vaccine been approved. Uh, the mRNA technology is very different from DNA technology because we have proven and published with academic labs around the world that when you inject or mRNA into uh, animals uh, or human cells in a petri dish, the mRNA does not get into the nucleus. So we believe this is a very important long-term safety feature that or mRNA, we believe, has very little to no chance, I want to be careful with absolute in science, to mix with human DNA, which is, of course, critical from safety standpoint. The way we plan to address this concern that we first have as the, the sponsor of this product. We do not want to help people. We are working hard to try to help people. And so safety is the number one priority for us, given you give vaccine to healthy uh, individuals, is we are planning to do very large safety study for a phase three. We have not again disclosed the number yet, but it's going to be many, many thousands of uh, healthy individuals that we intend to enroll in the US and in Europe, maybe other countries, to get a big safety database before this vaccine can be made available for millions. 